Welcome to the Knowledge Graph seminar, where we hope to learn a few things about how AI should explicitly represent knowledge. This week is the beginning of the spring quarter at Stanford. Therefore, I'm going to repeat some of the same slides that I showed at the previous session. The seminar is being co-organized by myself, uh, Naren and Mike. Our motivation for doing this seminar was that knowledge graphs are being used in a variety of applications, including web search, question answering, and data integration. And we also see knowledge graphs being mentioned as the representation of choice in recent research papers on machine learning, and natural language processing, and computer vision. National Science Foundation has recognized the importance of knowledge graphs as a topic, and they have recently launched a major new research program where they have funded 20 projects developing knowledge graphs for a variety of applications. This seminar series has a structure to it. Uh, in the beginning, we are asking some basic questions like, what is a knowledge graph? How do we create it? And then we get deeper into questions like how to reason with a knowledge graph, how to evolve it, um, and how to use it with modern AI algorithms, what are some of the high value use cases. And towards the end, we will ask the question, where's the research? What are some open problems that need to be addressed for knowledge graphs? Each session is set up as a panel of three individuals. Uh, we have put in some effort to bring in individuals with uh, different perspectives. In particular, we are trying to combine perspective of uh, traditional database systems and knowledge representation with online data curation with machine learning. We are hoping that each uh, panelist will begin with a presentation of not more than 30 minutes, which will leave us about 20 minutes at the end for questions. Any questions can be typed into the QA box and we will be taking the questions at the end, that is after three speakers are done. Some of the questions may be answered by the speakers live during the, uh, during the QA chat. For Stanford students, the attendance at the previous session was not required and going forward, they can attend any of the eight sessions uh, we are planning to make the recordings available from the course websites as and when they become available. Today, we are fortunate to have three distinguished speakers who have one common achievement, and that is they have been successful in taking their research, spinning it out into a company, which led to a successful acquisition. Today, we are going to hear from them uh, how to create a knowledge graph. And we will have Juan, he'll be starting us off. Juan, over to you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, share. You should be able to share your screen now. I am, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure and honor to be here and to give this talk, to give this lecture. So um, we're going to be talking about creating enterprise knowledge graphs from relational databases. And this is a subset of a talk that I'm giving about all on the social technical phenomenon of data integration. Um, so to start off a little bit about me, about uh, the company data.world that I represent, uh, Data.World is a data catalog company which has had a lot of data virtualization and federation technology, and we're built entirely on a knowledge graph. And uh, we've uh, built an open data catalog, and I just want to take a quick parenthesis, given the, the situation uh, that we're all in right now, uh, we, are host, we host a large amounts of data sets, and I just want to make sure that people know that we're, we're hosting a lot of the coronavirus data sets out there. So please take a look if you're doing any type of research on this. Um, I joined the company Data.World through the acquisition of my, my company called Capsenta. 
uh, Capcenta was a company that I founded uh, based off the research that I did in my PhD in computer science at the University of Texas at Austin. And, and my work uh, and, and those of my advisor and colleagues were about understanding the relationship between relational databases with the entire semantic web technology stack, such as RDF graphs, OWL ontologies, as Sparkle graph queries, and so forth. Um, so we have, I've been working on creating knowledge graphs, what we call nowadays knowledge graphs, from relational databases for, for over 10 years. So in this uh, lecture here, it, my objective is twofold, but I, I want to be able to provide some context first. And I know the context is I'm coming from uh, applying our, re our research, our work into the enterprise scenario. So large companies where our sources of data are going to be relational databases. In other talks and other conversations, you will see that a lot of the sources of data can be text, can be web data and so forth. The, my focus here is about relational databases in the enterprise setting. And the use case is about business intelligence. It's about being able to integrate data to be able to answer business questions. In other scenarios, you can see knowledge graphs being used for a search, for example. But here, it's business intelligence. And two things I want you to take away in these short 30 minutes is I want to, to provide an introduction on the status quo of data integration within the enterprise, and then introduce you about the, of our approach of creating knowledge graphs where we combine people, methodologies, and tools. So let's just let's kick this off on data integration. Um, a, a seminal paper back from pods almost 20 years ago by Lynn Serini presents kind of this theoretical perspective of data integration. And I like this definition, which is very clear. A data integration is the problem of combining data from different sources, providing a user with a unified view of this data. So there's usually three elements involved. So you have your different source databases, you have a global schema or a global target ontology, and you're creating mappings from the source to this target, to this global schema. And over the last 20 plus years, we've been going, the, the science, the academia, and, and industry has been working on so many different tools and algorithms and systems for schema and ontology matching, record linkage, incomplete data, data quality, and so forth. Now, let's talk about some of the real problems that we see in the real world when it comes to doing the integration. One, if we look at the source, in enterprise databases, we're talking about really complex systems that have way too many tables and too many attributes. If you look at systems like uh, Oracle ERP systems, they'll have 20,000 tables and you can imagine how many attributes. So we're not talking about your textbook database that has a table, a table called order, a table called customer. No, we're talking about thousands of tables. And then the naming of these tables, the naming of these columns are impossible to understand sometimes. If you're working with systems such as SAP, they may even be written in German, for example. The systems are very complex to get the data. So if you want to get information about like orders and the, cu the customers, there's like no two tables that can join them. You have to have all these complex relationships to be able to join all this table. And the reason why is because the data has been modeled and created to support the application. The people who are around the data who may understand these systems are usually unavailable because they're very, very busy with an organization. And the documentation is non-existent or if it does exist, it is very, very old and outdated. And people who really need to be able to get the data, they can't get the data all the time because it's just off limits or they will get a dump of the data or a spreadsheet of the data. And you have no idea about the quality of data. And how, how do you actually know, for example, what does a null value in my data mean? So that's one of the, the, these are several of the issues that we see all the time in large scale enterprise systems. Now, when we talk about the target, right, your global schema, your target ontology, uh, there are so over the last 20 years, sophisticated methodologies that have been developed to, def to design these target ontologies and these schemas, these conceptual models, all driven by competency questions and test-driven development and so forth. I mean, good practices tell us to go reuse ontologies, reuse existing ontologies out there. Uh, but I, what we observe is that a lot of these methodologies kind of take into account just the target schema, but are not taking into account the way how to populate the target with data that comes from a source system. Now, when we look at the, uh, the mappings, a lot, a lot, a lot of work has been look, studied in schema matching and ontology matching. There's benchmarks for the last 15 years about how to do this. But what we observe is that these things work really well in in theory, but not in practice for these large scale enterprise settings. What we see is that the focus has been to understand correspondences or relationships between one to one things. So for example, is if a table here maps to another table here, or F name maps to first name and L name maps to last name. 
But in reality, these mappings are much more complex. So for example, you can have table names called master order, order, P order, order P. I mean, what do these things actually mean? And, uh, and what am I gonna map them? Or large systems that can be very customizable have tables that may have hundreds of columns that are just called segment one, segment two, segment 99. What do these attributes actually mean? You have to have a lot of extra knowledge that is not available just there in the system. Uh, my position, and I really hope to be wrong on this, but this is where I am right now, is that I don't think we will ever have large amounts of schema and mapping data to be able to train machine learning models to go do this at this at enterprise large scale. And I think this is why we need to start thinking more out of the box. So these are the come to a couple of technical issues. And, and so let me talk a little bit about the social issues that we're seeing is one, we see that what I like to call knowledge hoarding. Within an organization, people are the ones who understand how the data works, understand how the data is related. And they have power, they have, they have security because everybody comes to them with this information. So when you are going to go off and say, look, I want to democratize data, I want to be able to have the data self-service, they feel threatened. And it's really hard to work with people who have this knowledge, let it be in their head and documentation that you, but you may not know where it is. These are one of the real social issues that you have to go through within an organization to be able to combine and integrate data. So one of the things I wanna make sure that we understand is that I, I think over the last 20 years or more, we've been focusing on data integration as our goal, is our goal is to, put data, is to integrate data. But in reality, we integrate data with the goal of using the data for something. A person will use the data, for example, to answer a business question. So data integration is a means to an end. So if I asked a very particular business question, I can ask somebody in an e-commerce, uh, in the e-commerce department, this is the, let's use a use case of an e-commerce company, and they can give me a number. I can ask the shipping department and they give me a different number. I ask the finance department and they give me a different number for the exact same simple question of how many orders were placed last month. And why do, they, why do we have this discrepancy? It's because what do we even mean by the word order, right? The word order can mean different things to different people. For the e-commerce folks, it means when a, when, when, the, when a user clicked checkout, when the shipping is when the package was delivered. So these are when we start seeing the real semantic uh, issues that we see within an organization. So how do people actually answer these questions today? Meaning how do they integrate data to answer these questions? We see, for example, spreadsheet approaches where you have a data consumer asking a data engineer for data and they will work with the data architect if they're available, they'll write a query, they'll send a CSV file by email and the data consumer will open this up in Excel and go do something. And then every day they will probably get a new copy of that CSV file from different people. They'll have different spreadsheets and they'll start integrating the data within spreadsheets or they may even have an access database on their laptop and they are creating the little mini warehouse within their database and they're on the laptop and integrating the data. I mean, this is the typical process that we see and we don't even know if the messages are being communicated directly, correctly. Now, maybe the data engineer is tired of sending an email with the data so the data engineer will just send a query to the data consumer. And the data consumer starts getting all these different queries and they start joining and munging all these queries and then suddenly you see queries that are 10, 15 pages long. And this is, this is they're integrating data because they're combining data from different sources into one query, maybe having some federation system, but all of this, so much hidden knowledge gets embedded in these weird, very complex queries. Then a typical approach to see is that people will go do design a data warehouse and they will spend six months, 12 months, millions of dollars to go to define an enterprise data warehouse. And the, 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 the data engineers and the whole team says, hey, now your data is all in one place. You don't have to go use those ad hoc approaches to go integrate data. And guess what? They will, the data consumers will ask the, the same question to the data warehouse, but they'll most probably always get different answers than their ad hoc approach. And what happens is that the data consumers won't trust that data warehouse. They trust their ad hoc approach. And that's why these data warehouses don't uh, fail because they're not being used. Or they may forget all the requirements up front and then they have to go and change all these ETL scripts and they have to go redo a lot of work, re reverse engineer code that somebody else wrote that wasn't at the organization. And you end up what we call boiling the ocean in these aspects. Now, a, lot, a very popular approach is the data lake approach, but really is that you're now pushing your data all in one place and then transforming it and giving it to people to consume later. So you've really not kind of, you push the problem from one place to another. 
Now, the latest kind of approach is the data wrangling approach. Well, you, you'll see data consumers saying, oh, we want to have self-service tools to be able to kind of, I can do my stuff on my own. So you can have a data consumer who says, I'm going to go answer a question and I'll do this on my own. But you have another data consumer asking a, probably, possibly a, a relatively close question. And, and do you think that every data consumer and the work that's being done in these data prep tools, is that work being shared across? Is the work being are they reinventing the wheel? Are they taking different interpretations of how they're prepping the data? I, I saw this once with a customer and they were saying, oh, we've made all this analysis on large data. And they never shared the definition of large data and somebody interpreted it as something that has more than 10 items in it. And somebody else has something that had more than 15 items of it. At the end, they're all talking about large orders, but they all mean different things. So to summarize here the problem, and this was kind of the first goal of, of, of what I wanted to give in this lecture, was to really share the real world scenarios of data integration. This is what happens every day with an organization. And what we have is this gigantic gap, this data meaning gap between the consumers of data who want to be able to go take data and answer their questions, and the producers of data who manage it, and, and this, this, uh, this meaning is not being well bridged. So, Again, the famous, the famous thing we always hear is garbage in, garbage out. So we really need to be able to bridge this gap. So the question is, how do we bridge this gap? And uh, just kind of a little bit of historical uh, perspective, this is where we started seeing kind of the value of knowledge graphs. So within the research, we were, we were understanding how to design not, uh, graphs, be able to extract graphs from relational data. And we observed that this was a, uh, using knowledge graphs was a great way to bridge this data meaning gap. So a short answer is knowledge graphs, but there's the answer comes much longer, which is we really need to understand from a social technical point of view, how to best create these knowledge graphs, which is what I'm going to go across in the next uh, 15 minutes here. So I know we talked about this in the last, uh, in the last lecture, but I, I do want to give my perspective on this. This is my informal, what I call Juan's informal, inclusive, non-pedantic and non-scientific definition. For me, a knowledge graph is I want to be able to do data integration, so, and I want concepts and relationships to be first-class citizens within it. So it's not just about putting data together, but it's putting data together where the concepts and relationships are also a big part of the data that's being done. And this means that I am really linking data and metadata together, together and it happens to be that this is encoded in a graph. And this is what I mean by a knowledge graph. And what we're seeing knowledge graphs being now today is taking this, this large vision of computer science of integrating knowledge and data at scale. What we have seen over the last half a century is that you have a community of people working at data and understanding how to work with data at scale. And you have a community, uh, a community of researchers and scientists understanding how to deal with knowledge at scale. And what we're doing now with knowledge graphs under this umbrella of this term is combine these two and looking how we can do this at scale, both knowledge and data. Um, I always tell students, please take a look at, at events that occur at Dogstool because this is a gigantic uh, uh, library of just all this amazing thought that, people, that scientists put in together when they go meet at Dogstool. So at two years, almost two years, a year and a half ago, a group of us met to talk about knowledge graphs. And I highly recommend to go find, find this, the dog stool report that we did on this. And you will see uh, our uh, different perspectives. And one of the things that came out of this was uh, uh, a tutorial. Kind of, uh, it's a 130 page tutorial paper that we wrote on knowledge graphs that we just pushed it on archive a couple of weeks ago. So really what I'm trying to go do, my, my, what keeps me up at night, is how do we get from these complex and disparate databases, real world heterogeneous complex enterprise schemas to a knowledge graph of meaningful data, something that people can look at and they can understand themselves without going to try to figure that big messiness, they can understand this. But in reality, I want to understand how to get to this knowledge graph by taking into account the people inside of an organization. Because in our experience, this is not just going to be technology. Now, that's another quick takeaway that I want you to all have is that there's this technology fallacy that we've been seeing, is that the mistaken belief that just because a business challenge was caused by technology, that means it should be solved with technology. 
And I think that's another message I want to take away. I want you all to take away is that there needs to be a combination of the technology of the tools, but we also need to understand who are the people and the processes involved. So let me start with the people first. So the people, I've been talking about these data producers and data consumers. So a data producer can be like a data engineer. They're the people who understand the databases. They create the ETLs. And a data consumer can be an analyst, a data scientist, right? They understand the business. They understand the business questions. But there is this gap. And, and, I, and I want you to, I ask everybody, if you look at software engineering, we have well-defined roles. And one particular role that we have in software engineering is the role of a, as a product manager. And if you think about it, inside of data teams, we don't have that equivalent of a product manager. And I think we need to advocate for this type of role. And specifically, this is the role what I'm calling the knowledge scientist. And this is a lot of the work that was done in the 90s called the knowledge, knowledge engineering. But now it's kind of taking it a knowledge engineering 2.0 where we have a vast amount of data. And this, is, this role is a person who is the communication bridge between the consumers and the producers, who they know how to model data, but they know how to access data. They're people persons, but they're also geeks. So that's one particular aspect that I want you to take away. And you may be asking, well, how is this knowledge scientist different from the data scientist? Is we always talk about this 80 20 rule. And the knowledge scientist, in my perspective, is the, is the role who should be focusing on that 80% of the cleaning and organizing data. But I'm not talking about cleaning data because there's an extra zeros or spaces. It's really understanding the meaning of the data. And we're going to go through real examples on here. And I think the knowledge scientist is the person who's also responsible for your data, who understands where the data comes from and how the data has been organized. So let's go into the process. This is the meat. This is how we actually create knowledge graphs. So what we have observed and learned over the last couple of years is that we really need to have a methodology in place. And we need it to be an agile, iterative methodology. And one of the things that we want to be able to do is that we need to understand what does success look like. And given that our scenario is in this uh, business intelligence scenario, we want to be able to say, look, our starting point is a business question that I may not be able to understand or, or can, can answer, or if I answer right now, it's just very complex, it takes too much time, or I don't trust the answers. So if I'm able to answer this question and I understand where this data comes from, I define that as a success criteria. So we go first into what I call a knowledge capture phase. And we want to really understand that business question. We want to understand the whole processes around it and gather as much collection as we can and be able to document as much everything that we learned about this business question in a, in a report, which we'll go into. And then and this knowledge report is actually going to be the input to actually implement this knowledge. We want to go implement this target schema, implement the mappings and generate some of, this, some of the enterprise knowledge graph that we're going to be doing or generate, that we're going to start generating. What, we, what happens is that this first knowledge graph that comes out is going to be very small and the model is going to be mapped just for that one question on purpose. And this helps you address the cold start problem that you think that, that you want to be able to do something from, from, from scratch. What happens next is that you now have data people can understand and they can go on and build the reports and be able to answer their questions. If they're able to answer their question, success. We can go off to the next question. And if you go to the next question, you say, hey, can I answer this next question with the data that I already have? Oh, fantastic, you're done. Let's go to the next question. And if you can't, you say, okay, what's missing? And you say, let me go expand that model, expand the data little by little, and we keep iterating through this. So let me go in a little bit into the details of how this is done. So in a first approach, in this knowledge capture phase, uh, we want to be able to understand this as is process and the workflow within an organization. So uh, we want to understand what is the actual business problem? What is the question that we want to go answer? And we want to understand why is this important? Because people will have many questions they want to go answer and we really want to prioritize and understand who really cares about this. Now, who are the producers? Who are the consumers of this data? And how is this process being, how is this question being answered today, if, if at all? Uh, where does this data actually come from? Uh, when will this data be consumed? So we basically want to go through a bunch of these who, what, where, when, why scenarios to really understand the entire process that happens today. Now we want to be, if, if we can, we want to be able to focus on the, on the how and the what and be able to collect as much documentation as we can. 
So one approach that we have, for example, is that we say, look, people are, people are trying to answer these business questions today, but they're very, very complicated and it takes too much time. So let's look at the Excel spreadsheets that people have because there's macros in there that people have, or there's some ETL scripts that people are using, or there's complicated SQL queries. Let's understand who is the person who may have some rogue uh, access database on their laptop and they're doing things. Let's really collect as much as we can about this. And as you can imagine, this is where a knowledge, a knowledge scientist comes in and understands how, who to talk to and, and how to get that information. But, so what I really want, want you to, to take this away of why this is hard. So when we think about this, when we started out, I gave this example of what is an order, right? Imagine an order is a concept in my graph. And, and in, my, in, the, in the initial example I gave you, there were multiple versions of, of definitions of order. So after some type of discussion, we come, let's, let's assume we come to a consensus and we say, this is the definition of an order that we have. Okay, this is still in words. I need to be able to ground this. What are the, the, the actual semantics of the data? Let's ground this in the data. And when you realize, and after discussions, you realize this is the particular SQL query that is going to return everything that is in order, the unique identifiers for an order. And you have to know, for example, that order type in two and three are the ones that we need to look into. This may be even a simple example, and let's go into something called a little bit more complex. For example, what is the net sales of an order? Now you can think about it, right? I have a concept called an order, and then there is a, there's an attribute called net sales. Well, in financial terms, it's the gross minus the, the taxes minus the discounts. That's what, what the net sales is. But in this company, it could have a much more complex definition of what it is, right? You have to take into account the, the shipping costs and the taxes and the currency and so forth. What does this actually mean when we ground it? Oh, after making, talking to the right people, you realize this is the particular SQL query. So what you see is that on the left-hand side, we have these terms which are part of our target. And these queries are our mappings that are gonna connect the source. Mappings are rules, queries are rules. This is how we start connecting our source to our target. So with this information that goes on, you start generating, representing all this report, all this knowledge in a particular report. So we, let's go report what our concepts. So we say, okay, we believe that there is this concept called an order. It has a definition. Here is the query to get the orders. Uh, here is a particular, uh, we have this notion, an attribute called net sales, and after discussion, we know that this is the particular query that gets it. Uh, we know what the data type should be is, there should be no nulls, there's a cardinality. Um, what's the relationship between orders and order status, for example? Uh, this is, for example, a, you may have a table called order status that, that stores all the historical orders, but you only want the latest order. So you needed to have some aggregation about the order statuses. This probably was not evident and obvious when, if you looked at, the, uh, looked at the data by itself. So once you create this knowledge report, the who's involved, right? We had these three different roles. The knowledge scientist is the person who's communicating with the data analyst to understand the business questions. They're working with the data engineers to really understand the schema, con what contains in the data. And if there are disagreements or conversations go off in different directions, the good thing is that we have a measure of success, which is answering that business question. And this helps us drive consensus. And this knowledge report is something that can be understood by everybody. So at that moment, we stop in this iterative approach and we say, do we, does everybody agree on this report? If you don't, you go back into the knowledge, into this, you say this step, or you go forward to the knowledge implementation step. So when you go into the knowledge implementation step, what you're doing is that you are taking this report and now actually implementing it. We're gonna go and implement our ontology, our target schema. So now we start seeing this schema for our knowledge graph. We can see an order has an order status. And now I can actually take and implement these mappings. So I can say, I have my source database and I have my target schema. By the way, Vinay, I know that I have like five minutes left, so we're good. Um, I can start creating my mappings, the, my mappings from source to target. And uh, they're in, they're actually almost seven years ago now, there's actually standardized mapping languages from relational database to RDF graphs. And R2RML is that example to do that. Once you have these mappings, you want to now physically start either creating the physical knowledge graph data or even be able to do what we call virtualization. So two different approaches are, is that you either materialize your data or you virtualize it. And in a materialized, in a materialized approach is you're basically doing some ETLing. Is that you're saying, look, I'm taking my source relational data, 
I'm taking this mapping that has been defined, that has been implemented and defined through the previous process. And now I can extract that relational data, transform it to my graph using my mappings, and that can then load it into a graph database. Or I can do the virtualization or the opposite, what we call the no ETL approach. As we say, look, I want to write a Sparkle or a graph query in terms of that graph model that I have. And then our virtualizations, our semantic virtualization engines will take these Sparkle queries and use the mappings to translate them to a SQL query down to your database, and then it returns your answer. Or you can just, if you materialize the data, you can now write these queries directly onto your, into your graph database. So a lot of this work, a lot of the science, this was actually my PhD. This was actually what we, what we got out of the research and we patented, we make the company about, was be able to do these virtualization aspects between uh, Sparkle queries over relational databases. So at this moment, you start generating data and you can go validate the data. You can see if things look good. If there is issues, you can go back and figure out where, where things kind of got screwed up or not in the implementation phase. And if things go past some quality checks, you can now go into that self-service analytics and be able to go answer your business question. So let's go to that business question that we had, which is what are the orders and their net sales in the given time period per their status? Well, this is a particular question and I can write a query in terms of that same model that represents that question and that target ontology, that global schema that we defined. And this is the query that it says, if it says, give me everything that's an order, right? X is an order, return me the net sales, the order number, the date, the status, and the status has a, has a, has a name, and just project that. And now this query can be executed over your knowledge graph, let it be in a virtual knowledge graph, because it does your sparkle to SQL, or your graph to your relational, or it's been materialized. Um, and now you get your, your result of your data. And this is now data that any, of, any other uh, consumer data can easily use. Now, you could, have, you could have answered that question directly over the original source of that database. But for this very particular query, that is just a SQL query that you would have written. And this is where we go in bridging this conceptualization gap, this data meaning gap, is that this, is, this query, this, this uh, SQL query you see at the bottom, this is much harder to come up with than something that can be done on the left-hand side. And I remember uh, last week in a call at the, um, the presentation that uh, Jans Osman gave, he actually argued this too, right? If you compare the queries in terms of the graph compared to the SQL queries, they're going to be very, very different. And at the end, you can then even materialize and do kind of some sort of views, and then you can just provide an order table much more easily. So finally, from the tools perspective, I can go on and give another talk about tools. I think one of the things that, that we're doing uh, at data.world and, and my previous company was to be able to create these collaborative cloud-based tools to help users to be, bridge the gap. So this is, these are tools that we want to be able to understand that a knowledge scientist can do, can work with the business analysts, can create the mappings all within the same tool. Uh, because what we see is that one of the advantages of working with graphs is that you can write it on the whiteboard. And we are lacking a lot of these tools of creating models, uh, just these schemas, because people end up creating them in very complex tools or just even spreadsheets themselves. So I started 30 minutes ago with this question of how do we create knowledge graphs from, the enter from enterprise relational databases? One, I believe we need to be able to understand the people aspect and there is this role of the knowledge scientist that needs to be involved. We need to understand the process it's not just about the tools, but we need to have a process and we have this pay-as-you-go methodology that we presented. Uh, by the way, this is something that we have been working on for the several years and that process I presented is a paper at the International Semantic Web Conference last year. And, and finally, we need to have more tools, tools that understand how to combine those people and how to combine those processes together. Um, if you're interested, oh, and one final point is, I know that we're all very interested in a human in the loop is a very popular thing right now. Um, and I asked myself, is it really human in the loop? What if we want to be able to understand and control the process? And then as humans, we understand where the machine should be involved. And I think that's something we should be, I want somebody, I want you all to, to take that into account. Um, kind of finally to wrap up here, if you're interested more about the history of knowledge graphs, uh, together with Professor Claudio Gutierrez from the University of Chile, last year we've been working on we presented an entire tutorial about the history of knowledge graphs, and you can find a paper that we have designed there. Um, we're hiring at data.world, and we're always looking for research partners. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Juan, very much for an 
impassioned presentation on how to create a knowledge graph. Our next speaker is going to be Chris Ray. Chris, over to you. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Looks good? Yes, we can see it. Great, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me. I'm excited to chat with you about this. Uh, I've worked on knowledge graphs in some form for, for a long while, and, and Xiao, who I'll talk, uh, talk next, is, has been doing some really exciting work in, in that space, and we, we collaborated and worked together. And as was mentioned, did a company that was acquired by Apple. What I'm going to talk about is some work that grew out of that work in knowledge graphs and really was at this kind of centerpiece of how do we fuse knowledge and statistical machine learning together uh, to build these new kind of systems. And it led to a bunch of work, which is in weak supervision, uh, which powers actually some systems you, you may have used, but is really to me a fundamental problem in machine learning. How do we bring knowledge and statistical reasoning together? So I'll, I'll describe it to you uh, in those terms. So if you think about a machine learning application uh, at a high level, it really has three pieces. It has a, a model, it has some data, and it has some hardware. And if you're someone who's been really following the area closely, you know that you know, cloud providers and all the rest are bringing hardware out there. Um, but also models are available in a way like never before. You can pip install models from say places like Hugging Face that are great and automatically you have you know, state of the art models for, for various different things. And that's, that's because people have invested so much time in that software infrastructure. So these two things are available in, like never before, but somehow this, this key ingredient, the training data is not available, right? And in some ways it feels like it, it really can't be available or commoditized in the way of the first, the first and the last, because it's really the way you program. It's the way you define your application. It's the specification that you're trying to build. And so in a real way, training data has not been commoditized. And so we started to look at this idea of, could we make it sort of a little bit less awful to create all that training data, as our last speaker talked about, that is lacking in a lot of these applications. Now, when I teach you know, 229, um, you know, the first content-filled lecture, lecture two, we start with supervised machine learning. And we start with these X and Y pairs. We say there's some X's and we want to predict the labels Y that are on top of them. When we look at this uh, information, we have no idea where those X and Y pairs come from. And if you talk to machine learning people, sometimes you feel like, you know, these X and Y pairs just fell from the sky and they, they came from God herself. And, and that's really when machine learning begins. Now, as anyone who's, who's actually built one of these products in, in industry or uh, in scientific applications knows, that's not the world that we live in more often instead of hanging out with Beyonce in kind of a beautiful environment, we're hanging out in an environment that looks a little bit more like this. This is a picture of a sewer. And what we have to deal with are these dirty, messy streams of data that we have to figure out how to combine and how to build that training set out of. And it usually comes from a process of data we have laying around or new data that you know, we want to create for the purpose-built uh, reason of, of creating these models. So what this work led to in, in some experiences in extracting and building and using knowledge graphs is really this idea, could we build a mathematical and a system structure that captures some of this messy process, that sort of captures all the information that we know is going on there and kind of makes it a little bit less awful. Now, I'm gonna go one step beyond kind of just making it a little bit less awful and I'll argue for the next little while that this is actually a place that's really critical in machine learning right now, sort of the state of the art in machine learning right now what I mean is that this is supervision, this kind of uh, training data construction is actually where all the action is. And modeling differences are vastly overrated and supervision differences are vastly underrated. Right? Now it's not that models aren't important, they're clearly important. My lab still works on them and all the rest. But I think this waiting in our mind of what makes a successful or a failing machine learning system really has been weighted kind of strangely over the last couple of years. And we need a little bit more work on the supervision side. And lots of folks are jumping in here, but I want to highlight. It. Now, as I mentioned, I, I like to work on kind of real and interesting things. We've worked a lot with folks over in the medical school. Uh, this is a, a joint work that I'll talk about just to highlight one piece that was in radiology, a clinical journal. Uh, all the people in ties are physicians. The people without ties are, are not physicians on this paper. And this was published in radiology in 2019. So let's look at this problem. So the problem we want to look at is we want to understand, you know, there are too many of these images, these radiographs. And the problem is the experts that could look at these images simply don't have time. So the image is taken and actually no one ever looks at it. And this is like a perfect example of something that you would want to build machine learning systems on and maybe even use medical knowledge graphs to help you diagnose them. 
Now, I'm not claiming this. Many other folks have talked about it. We're not identifying this problem. But Jared, who was on the last slide, so I started to ask, what would it take to really build a machine learning system here that would help with this kind of triaging application? So we looked at this question and said, you know, is, is machine learning really the answer or deep learning really the answer? And it turns out this is really not an easy question. At the time, there was no benchmark data set. There are now benchmark data sets that are being created, which is great. The effects of data quality were completely unclear on these models. There was no assessment of the existing algorithms on top of these models. And there was really no feedback from the clinical community. So he spent a year trying to answer this. He created a large data set of clinical labels. He evaluated the effect of label quality. And importantly, he published it, as I mentioned, in a clinical journal. Now, I won't bore you with all the details of, of this thing, although it's a very cool paper. I, I think it's one, fun to read. But here's one little takeaway from the paper. If you know your machine learning and you follow the state of the art, you recognize some of these names. AlexNet, one of the famous models in, in machine learning and image classification. DenseNet, one of the most famous recently as well. And there's their test accuracy. Now, what's interesting is that top model, the bag of words model, that's a model you could have very sort of conveniently trained in the early 2000s. And so the difference between them was actually only a couple of points. So in a real way, the label quality and quantity modeled way more than the model choice, at least in these examples. Now you may look at this and say, oh, well, maybe it's an easy example. I don't think it is, but maybe you think, oh, these are kind of easy things. What about other areas of machine learning? And I'll just highlight that even on things like benchmarks, like CIFAR 100, which is a, a very popular image benchmark, if you remove data augmentation from your pipeline, all of a sudden you're talking about losing tens of points in accuracy, whereas the models that are trained here, people are fighting over you know, one point here or one point there. So all I hope to get across from this is that training signal is really key to pushing the state of the art in a lot of different areas, and it's really important. So two that I love to highlight here, Google had this great paper, Auto Augment. It followed on a paper that my students, Alex and Henry, uh, wrote in uh, NeurIPS 2017 which basically looked at this idea of learning how you change and modify data as a first class citizen. Sharon, Sharon Lee, who was a postdoc in my lab, but did this work before that when she was at Facebook, trained this absolutely massive model where she used weekly supervised pre-training to train these kind of big image uh, data sets. And sort of, this is a really exciting way of using all that data to make more robust models. And for a while, that was actually the state of the art in image classification. So what I hope to get across is that this is really at the forefront of a lot of machine learning. I will do a little plug here. Uh, Sharon has a great blog post that she started writing. She will be writing one about how text augmentation is, is actually getting used, which is something we're really excited about. And that's something interesting in knowledge-based construction uh, as well. And I invite you to take a look at those various different blog posts, really exciting stuff. So at this point, all I hope that I've convinced you of is that training data is some kind of new bottleneck. And if you haven't thought about it before, you may wonder like, well, in what ways is training data kind of bad? Well, I would argue that the conventional way that we build these training sets are way too slow, they're way too expensive, and importantly, they're static. So what do I mean by this? Well, they're slow because the first label that you produce and the last label you produce in traditional manual annotation, they cost about the same amount. Humans don't get radically better at creating these data sets as they go through them. They're also very expensive. We have a paper that appeared this last year uh, in Nature Communications, in which we were looking at radiologists who were looking at uh, videos of the heart, and they realized that actually only one out of every 200 images actually was something that they could find the phenomenon they cared about, this rare genetic defect. And so as a result, they were unable, it was cost a huge amount of money for them to label uh, and look at and label all of these videos. And more seriously, these problems, these labels are typically static. So these are things like if you imagine you label your data set as positive and negative, and then someone comes back to you and says, I want positive, negative, and neutral. Well, the conventional way that you'll deal with this requires that you simply relabel the entire data set. So we wanted to look at a way of fusing knowledge into the process to try and make it, as I said, a little bit less awful. This doesn't mean that we've solved the problem entirely, but we want to look at approaches that try and mitigate some of these things. And as I said, it's an ongoing process. So we looked at one framework. We've actually looked at a couple. And I'll talk about this one in terms of programmatic labels. So they're faster. The idea is you're going to write these little programs that are going to label lots of data for you. And so once you write them, they can label huge amounts of data at sort of AWS or machine speed. They're going to be cheap because they're also going to run at machine speed. And we'll talk about some of those examples. 
And they're also dynamic in that you can refactor your labels like code instead of having them just in kind of this extensional data that's just laying out there for you. So the trade-off, and this is what we're going to worry about statistically, is that these labels are going to be much lower quality. So we get this, this, all this good stuff of fast, cheap, and dynamic, but we have a problem. These labels are going to be potentially have errors, and they're potentially going to be correlated in interesting ways. And so we're going to try and reason about that, and the art is to reason about that without resorting to traditional hand label data. So how does this work? So first, we're going to need an interface for training data via weak supervision. I'll describe that. We'll talk a little bit about an approach to learn quality and correlations of sources. There are other slides and an entire other website I can point you to if you really care about the technical details. My goal is just to give you a sense of what's possible here. And then you'll be able to train an end model. And so if you look at this from kind of an AI knowledge graph perspective, what we're trying to do here is take human knowledge expressed in these programs or things from the discrete knowledge graph world and kind of blend them very nicely with modern deep learning techniques. That was one of the impulses for building these systems. Now, we didn't invent the idea of using lower quality labels. This is something that every machine learning person worth their salt is, have been doing for at least a decade or more. You can go back to things like Hearst patterns in the 90s. People were using these very heuristic kinds of rules to help them label information in text to be able to extract knowledge graphs. People have been using knowledge graphs in a technique called distance supervision for a long time, where you have a set of tuples or triples, and you try to look for them in text to be able to extract more and sort of find the linguistic patterns that allow you to complete your knowledge graph, sometimes called knowledge-based completion. And my point is, we talked about augmentation. There are many, many more of these. The idea here, what we were going at is saying, really to build these exciting big knowledge graphs and a host of machine learning projects, you really had to figure out a way to take these ad hoc methods that were applied one, one at a time and put them together in these, instead of being isolated, figure out how to combine them. And so that's where the theoretician in me kind of takes over. We started to try and understand, could we come up with a formal, unified, theoretically grounded approach for programmatic labeling that would encapsulate many of those different things? and make it easier to build this next generation of programs. And we came out with this thing called Snorkel, which I'll describe, uh, which basically took in all those weak supervision sources, tried to assign confidences to them, and then uses that downstream in a whole host of different things. Now, as any professor who works at all can tell you, someone else did the real work. Faculty are not the people you should trust or listen to. It's always the students who did it. Um, faculty were students long ago when it doesn't, that no longer matters. These are the human beings who really did the work. Stephen Box now at Brown, Braden, Henry, Alex, and Paroma uh, are hanging out and doing some stuff, and Alex is going to Washington next year. You can check out their website, snorkel.org, for some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about that spun out of the lab. So let me give you a more concrete example uh, of how this could kind of work for sort of knowledge graph relevant patient uh, projects. So let's say that you want to do named entity recognition. You want to go into text and you want to be able to extract the people, places, and things, perhaps to fill out a knowledge graph uh, to complete it as you run through it. So here we see Bob Jones, who's a person, a doctor in this case, and we want to be able to also get organizations and you know, find out potentially even interesting relationships between them. So the goal is I want to show you how to label training data using weak supervision for these tasks. So basically the way that it works at a high level, if we look at this St. Francis entity here, is that we would have various different labelers. So let's look at a simple labeler. We have some existing classifier, we wrap it in a simple Python function and it will vote. Now this labeler is wrong. I think St. Francis is a person, but that's okay. These things can be wrong. Another labeler comes along and it slightly refines the person classifier with some extra little bit of metadata. But unfortunately here, it's also wrong as well. And finally, we look this up in our knowledge graph and we see actually St. Francis is in our hospital data set and we get a vote here that hospital is actually correct. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is in very simple examples, you have sources that are noisy, that, are conf that conflict with one another, and that are correlated in some way. And we have to figure out those correlations and those accuracies without ever looking at, at hand-labeled data. Okay. So that's the art. So the way this works is people write these labeling functions in the first version of Snorkel. Those then go to a label model. If you're an old school AI or machine learning person, we're effectively trying to estimate the parameters of a graphical model where you have a latent variable that corresponds to the ground truth. And we're classifying exactly when that's possible or not. Then that is used to do forward inference to figure out some probabilistic training data, which is then fed into your favorite deep learning model. And the key idea is that the probabilistic training points, the inference we're doing there, 
carries the accuracy of how confident we are in every one of those points. And this gives us a way to inject that knowledge, maybe from knowledge graphs, maybe from other sources, into the process in a hopefully lighter weight way and still use these nice statistical models under the covers. I should say for historical reasons, we did try to do it in many other approaches. This is our most recent incarnation of trying to do this rather than fusing them say bottom up as we used to do maybe in the deep dive days, the system that we wrote a couple years ago. So why might you do this? A couple reasons. First is that it improves generalization. People tend to write these rules that are very precise but for example, the deep learning model knows things about synonyms and can relax them in kind of an optimal way. And so the recall of this extraction task that we we're talking about can actually be dramatically improved. So your labeling function may mention a certain set of terms, treats, causes, disease, uh, induces, prevents. But when you run it through the deep learning model, you can actually get phrases like could produce a, supported diagnosis of, other sort of rephrasings of this that are linguistically quite common, but you didn't have time to write in your training set creation. So this is kind of an exciting thing that it can do. A second thing that it can do is it can scale with unlabeled data. And that's really exciting. You feed in more unlabeled data and more labels come out. And this is just a schematic plot from a real experiment where as you put in more data, uh, it's actually scaling and substantiating that kind of faster, cheaper claim I was making before. The third reason, which is much more interesting and much more late breaking for knowledge graphs is it allows you to take information from structured or unstructured sources like knowledge graphs and apply them to new domains. So here, what I wanna do is, actually this is a real application with Stanford Medicine. I wanna be able to look at those radiographs that I described and classify them as abnormal or not. Actually to a more refined hierarchy, but just take it there. The problem is labeling these images is quite intensive and quite expensive. So what we wanna do is use training data as a medium for knowledge transfer. So the idea here is that we'll write those labeling functions actually over text reports and other kinds of structured data as a way to label that information now those reports are written after we see the image. So we can't use the report at test time when a patient walks in because we only have the image. So what we do is we do all this inference offline to be able to create this training set and then we train a purely image classifier. Said another way, this image classifier is servable, it's available at test time, whereas this other piece down here is not servable and so it's not available at test time. One thing that I'll, I'll share with you if I have time is actually this weak supervision approach that we talked about said that in hours of doing weak supervision, it actually matched manual labels collected on the image over person years of data. And I'll try and substantiate for you why that's true. Okay. okay, so these are the things that we were talking about. Now, you could definitely look at this and say, well, that seems like some crazy academic nonsense. Uh, you know, who's gonna make up training data? And I think that was kind of the conventional wisdom when we first started the project. Like this seems like a crazy idea. Who's gonna go out and use this thing? Uh, what's gonna happen? Now what's been kind of amazing is that lots of people started to use it. And one of the reasons is, it's not that it's a great necessarily built thing when, when it was in the academic side. It was really that this was filling a need in that pipeline of how you built machine learning systems. And it was the first one that was really thinking about it. And so lots of folks, this is an incomplete set of logos, actually started using it. And I'll throw a couple of different highlights in there to show you that these are some serious folks who are using it in, in some nice ways. So Google very publicly has something that they call Snorkel Dry Bell, uh, which was actually built in collaboration, which is running in production inside Google. And it's used on some of their most, you know, some important problems that are there. And basically what it does is it allowed them to use all this organizational knowledge resources, things like knowledge graphs, web crawlers, aggregate statistics, and talked about how they pushed all that information together in Snorkel Dry Bell to be able to rapidly create and supervise these models. The paper was in Sigma 2019. There's a bunch of blog posts from the Google blog post and our own describing actually how this works. That non-servable to servable feature transfer that I talked about was absolutely critical to get these models online in people's hands. One of the things I'm most proud of in you know, the work that we've done are my students. And my students have done unbelievable work over the last couple of years. What's kind of surprising is that these, weak, these ideas and weak supervision, you may have used in some way. I'll flag one system that was really exciting to construct at Apple, uh, which is a system called Overton, which uses knowledge graphs in various different ways. It was you know, posted online, you can, you can check it out. And also the Gmail folks were really nice to talk about how their infrastructure really pretty closely mirrors what goes on in Snorkel. And they were, they were very generous about doing that, especially in the talk about how this was built actually into the, the extractors inside uh, Gmail and how they able, were able to create an entirely new way to build their system using these kinds of ideas. So I'm pretty excited about how this changes how people program. 
I would also throw out some data. This is some data from that CIDR paper that I just mentioned. Actually, a number of teams started using weak supervision much more dramatically than they were using sort of conventional supervision previously. And so you start to see that the amount of weak supervision in industrial products is actually creeping up over time, which is super exciting. And this is not just unique to this paper. We've heard anecdotally from many folks that this is actually how they're starting to construct some of their models related to things that look like knowledge graph, extraction, and even image applications. So super exciting. I also wanna point your uh, kind of uh, look you at a couple of different places here. Things like Ludwig, which is a super cool system I would point out from Piero, it's online. Uber, Piero Molino wrote it. It's a really awesome system that shares a lot in common with Overton and is really like, you know, one of those things that is just a, a really well done system. Andre Carpathia, a former student here at Stanford, uh, now at Tesla, wrote this great blog post about software 2.0. I think people looked at it and didn't really appreciate all the really exciting things that are in there about why software is changing. And I think Snorkel is an example of, of how, it's, how it's changing. And of course, you know, these new tools that have come online in the last couple of years, funded by various different large companies are exciting. I focused a little bit on the, on the side of here of, of places this has been used in industry, but I wanna point out that in medical cases, this is some of the stuff I'm most excited about. People using this cross-modal weak supervision, uh, which is coming out in press relatively soon. We've used it to do things like extract the GWAS data, largest GWAS data set. These are these genome-wide association knowledge graphs. It was actually built on top of this. This is the Nature Communications 2019 with a Voldemir. Uh, actually built that. He built that independently of us on top of Snorkel. It's been used on medical records to do medical record extraction. Uh, Allison and Jason Fries, the NPG uh, digital medicine was all about that. And it's even been used on a bunch of imaging applications. I'll even point out that it was used to do a build, construct a large knowledge graph of how of patient injury and death inside the FDA to try and look at machine sort of patient notes and do machine reading around that to find complications uh, inside the data set. So these are places where people had something implanted in them, uh, you know, a hip replacement, a knee replacement, and they're in their medical notes, it would say some indication of pain or discomfort. And Jason Fries, who's on the job market now, there's some people, you know, on the line. If you're hiring, Jason's amazing. You should hire him. Uh, he wrote this wonderful paper about using snorkel-like ideas. And in the same spirit, he actually just tweeted out something this morning about using this and creating a resource that can help people with sort of COVID-related things. This is all Jason's doing. It's super exciting. Okay, so let's just go back for radiology for one minute so I can establish kind of what I, what I mean here by quality. How does this thing work? So remember this example, we have a bunch of text, we have some labeling functions, we have a generative model, we have a discriminative model, and we wanna chain an image classifier. So we wanna leverage this idea in Snorkel, which is called data programming, to go across these different modalities to make this a little bit easier. This part is the servable part, we want the image. This part is not servable in the text. So this is a real data. So these are physicians collected person months of data, and this was the AUC curve that they got. Okay. They collected years of data, right? And here they actually got, you know, this is the curve underneath it, where this is after a person years of data collection. Jared, my postdoc, uh, and now uh, who just, who's just leaving uh, to, to go do a bunch of cool stuff and is now becoming a visiting researcher here, wrote, sat with them for eight hours. Now, Jared's super smart, so his eight hours is not equivalent to everyone's eight hours, but it wasn't year, person years. He sat down with these folks, not being a domain expert, and said, what are the indications in those reports to be able to train those images? And he just gave himself, you know, a Saturday, basically, to do this with them. Here's the results of using Snorkel. Now, it turns out here that actually you can get higher quality. That's great, but that's not what's really exciting. What's really exciting is instead of taking your machine learning system that we're talking about human in the loop, instead of taking it from days or years or months to be able to get your first results, this is potentially getting first results in hours. You would love to be able to have, to move to this model of kind of much more iterative machine learning, not something we're working on quite a bit. And I think is a place where knowledge graphs will play a really intimate role. We have a lot of related work. I'll flash a blog thing up here uh, about weak supervision. There's lots and lots of stuff that's related and it's super, super exciting. One other thing that I'll point out, because this is a sort of knowledge graph stuff, is that the software 2.0 and weak supervision has also been used for data integration and data cleaning. And Theo, a former postdoc in my lab, uh, Shu, who's now a professor at Georgia Tech, and Ehab Ilyas, who's a professor at Waterloo, have a great tutorial that's been given a couple times recently in Sigmod, VLDB, and KDD about how data integration and machine learning actually fit together nicely. 
and they have some really exciting results about how they can improve both the precision and the recall compared to state-of-the-art approaches to cleaning. And as our last speaker mentioned, one of the things that's hard in these data integration and data cleaning problems is getting that training data. So that's been something that's really exciting to see that you can address that over some structured data. And I point you to those folks because they're the real experts on this, not me. So the last thing I wanted to talk about very, very briefly is some of our future directions. And I wanted to give you this analogy because I think we're just at the beginning of this kind of high level change about how we build these machine learning systems. So if you think about the conventional programming stack and compare it to the machine learning stack, you think about individual labels, they're kind of the zeros and ones of, of machine learning. And they look like a machine learning language. They're kind of like the bit banging that you would have to do, you know, if you didn't have an instruction set. You just program by putting in zeros and ones. These labeling functions and what we've been writing here in Snorkel, those are really almost like assembly language. They're very low level still. They're kind of trying to summarize a lot of different, different issues that are there. And the statistical theory, which I haven't gone into, tells us how to figure out how accurate and how correlated they are. There's a whole line of work on that, on the getting that nailed down. But you could also imagine doing higher level things like advanced primitives to be able to combine them in various different ways, use libraries, use this analogy that labeling functions are more like code to be able to build up libraries of how these are built. In fact, the thing that Jason Fries just released was a library of labeling functions to help with EHR primitives. I'm really excited about this direction where we turn supervision from a data problem into more of a code kind of problem. We've also done a host of things about compiling uh, labeling functions from natural language, a paper called Babel Label, which my former student Braden wrote, uh, about how you can take natural language utterances and figure out from them underlying labeling functions. And we're also doing a whole bunch of work right now on generating these labeling functions and other ideas from user behavior. So if you're curious about the future directions, the bosses of my lab uh, are the students and the postdocs. They have this new website that they just put up, as you see in February 28th, and they basically laid out a whole bunch of these different things that they've done and learned so far and where they're going next. And if you're excited at all about this direction, you know, take a look at it, read it, send us feedback. Uh, please send positive feedbacks to students and postdocs and save the negative stuff for me. I'm, I'm happy to take that. But there's a lot of cool stuff here, and, and we hope that it inspires someone. So in conclusion, uh, what I described here was a framework for creating training sets for these different multitask kinds of models in a wide array of different places. I didn't get a chance to share this nugget with you, but I really wanna highlight it. This is not an ad hoc thing. We have a, a whole bunch of statistical theory about how this connects to very classical problems in machine learning. And we made a whole bunch of progress there. I'm super excited to talk to you about that. There are notes that are available online about how we actually do that. But that's the real the science of what we're up to, is doing that statistical estimation without access to labeled data. And that's what enabled us to build this snorkel kind of system. I think this change to programming by supervision changes what systems you build and how you build them, and also how useful these resources are. We've seen large companies be really excited because, you know, and even medium-sized enterprises who have knowledge graphs because it kind of uncorks a way for them to use this for a variety of downstream machine learning tasks. And I think we're just at the outsets here. And I want to be clear, like, we're super proud of our work because, you know, everyone should take pride in their work, but we don't claim to have all the answers. We think we're at the very beginning of what's going on, not anywhere near the middle or the end. So please check out snorkel.org if you're, if you're interested in these directions and uh, really happy to, to talk to you today. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Chris, for an inspiring presentation. I know how hard it is to build training data and you are addressing this problem which nobody else seems to even understand. So thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Chow. Chow, over to you. Cool. Um, thank you. Let me just share. Can everybody see my, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Let me start this as well. Okay, awesome. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm super excited to talk about uh, things I've been working on in the past few years at Apple, at Siri. So um, let me briefly uh, maybe give you an introduction of who we are and what we do. Um, I'm from a team called Siri Knowledge, which is part of Siri. And we have two main ultimate mi uh, missions. So one is to build a knowledge graph that potentially and eventually uh, represents all human knowledge. And the second one is we want to be able to open, uh, kind of answer open domain questions on S-Series using the knowledge graph that we built. 
Um, I I will spend most of my time, uh, you know, uh, telling you about how we actually build an Nash graph, but I want to spend a couple minutes uh, talking about what I meant by question answering. So uh, on on the uh, on any kind of series supported uh, Apple device, so I'm using the iPhone as an example. Uh, we actually answer a, a bunch of like what we call factoid questions, where we actually, um, you know, use a, a fact uh, stored in an algebra to answer questions that users issue. So things like how many championships has a sports team won, who are the members of the Beatles, uh, things like that. And it's it's not just on the iPhone; it's also uh, you know the same capability is uh, you know, allowed uh, and provided on other devices such as iPad, Mac, uh, Watch, HomePod, AirPods, et cetera. Xiao, uh, we are still yeah. seeing the first slide. Uh, is that the intention? I'm sorry? We are still seeing your first slide, your opening slide. Did you check? Oh, OK. It? Yeah, I, I think I did. Uh, OK, let me try this. I was using a remote. Uh, does that help? Well, now we can see your slide, uh, your next slide, but you're not in the slideshow mode. I mean, this will work if this is the way to do it. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, let me see if I can, okay. Let me reshare. So you can see my slides right now, right? Yeah, Under, but not, not okay. in the slideshow mode though. Okay, let me try this. Yeah, we can see it now in the slideshow mode. Okay, great. I, I apologize yeah, for that. Missions. That's the slide title. Missions? Yes. Can you, can you see the next slide? Uh, no, it did not change. Okay. Um, I mean, it's fine to do it without the slideshow. It'd be fine. Okay. Let me. Uh, okay. Let me just share my whole, whole screen and see if it works. Does that work? Yeah, that's working. Now we are okay. seeing open domain question answering. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Uh, let me quickly recap. Um, so I was talking about two missions. The first one being a building a knowledge graph representing all human knowledge. And the second one is to be able to provide question answering capability for uh, those factoid questions. And I was uh, referring to some examples presented here and also devices. Um, and I'm moving on to this slide. So in addition to, uh, you know, Siri uh, services, we also provide, you know, similar uh, question answering services to uh, uh, things like Spotlight. If you're, you're using an Apple device, you might be familiar with this. Uh, you can just type a query and we, uh, we will show you uh, the relevant Siri knowledge card. In addition to that, there are other a couple, you know, other features that we support. So for example, if you uh, highlight a, a phrase or an entity you want to look, look up, uh, you can actually uh, do the highlight and look up a feature. You can use that feature on Mac OS. Um, on Safari, if you type a query directly, if we can answer, uh, if there is, if this is a question that we can answer, we'll just show you the uh, right entity uh, from the address bar. So uh, that's, um, that's kind of a very brief introduction of uh, what I meant by uh, question answering. I will be spending most of the uh, you know, rest of the time uh, talking about kind of how we actually build an art graph as Siri. I want to start with uh, how we actually look at this problem at a high level. We view this as a data problem. We basically have a bunch of inputs generally categorized um, by, uh, you know, in four classes. And structured data. So things like text, images, videos, uh, things like that, where, you know, from a mission perspective, there's just no structure because, for example, a news article is simply just a string, a sequence of characters. Um, the other classes are semi-structured, structured, and manual curation. 
the semi-structured data has uh, usually just synthetic structure, but there are, uh, the individual values are not semantically annotated. Uh, structured feeds are more like, um, uh, you know, maybe individual, maybe tiny knowledge bases where we want to integrate. Um, things very similar to the first speaker, uh, what, what first speaker was talking about. We also have a curation capability where, uh, you know, a human annotator can go in and just uh, mark something wrong. Uh, for example, we have uh, tons of automatic extraction systems running, so errors are in inevitable. So sometimes if there is a production issue, then we need to be, uh, uh, it's nice to have this uh, capability. But if we entirely rely on human curation, it's just not scalable because we have uh, millions, um, if not billions of facts over there. It's just, we can't hire so many people to curate, um, you know, to catch up with the um, information we produce uh, in modern world. One key thing I want to highlight here is despite the different natures of uh, those inputs, uh, whatever models, extraction systems that we build, we aim at producing in the same format, a, you know, basically uh, what we call canonical triples. So once we have, a, you know, canonical triples where each triple is a predicate, um, is a subject predicate object triple, we can uh, actually uh, look at potential duplications from different sources, um, you know, resolve potential conflicts from them. So this is not like a, a new problem that I invented, it has been studied in the past, uh, and we call this fusion. And on top of that, once we, we use, uh, we go through the fusion process and produce a consistent notch graph, we can actually uh, run additional inference um, to generate, you know, new facts that are not available from the existing one. Um, for the rest of my talk, I I will I will use Wikidata in place of uh, Siri notch graph so that I don't need to refer to any internal names, um, and this is more accessible for the audience. All right, so uh, this is how we kind of um, you know build our notch graph from the high level. I want to introduce you to two concrete problems we have studied in the past. So the first one is called info box extraction. So the problem is really simple. Oh, it's actually tackling the, uh, the semi-structured data where you actually have a, an HTML table. I call it semi-structured because uh, the HTML markup, it's synthetic. Uh, it only tells you, hey, here is a string and here is another string. They belong to different cells, but the individual cell, it, doesn't, it still doesn't know what entity it actually meant. Um, and just to give you a sense of what's the input, what's the output, if you look at it, you know, oh, and, uh, and also I believe everyone has used Wikipedia in the past. So if you, uh, the info box table uh, is basically kind of the top right, uh, usually it appears in the top right corner of a page, uh, summarizing the facts of the uh, subject entity. And um, the input is basically either the HTML table or um, the Wikimedia code that, that's used to render the HTML. And the output uh, will be as, as I mentioned earlier, um, the canonical triples. The, by canonical, I meant uh, those triples, the subject relation and uh, object fields need to be represented by identifiers rather than just strings. I still show strings here for, um, uh, for, you know, for you to understand easily, but uh, what we are looking for are the kind of the Q, uh, QIDs and PIDs uh, in red. All right, um, so, you know, this info box extraction problem has been studied in the past in the literature. However, to some extent, it has been thought of as a solved problem. Um, when we look at the literature, it hasn't been much uh, research work since maybe 2015. The, the, most, uh, the latest work um, you know, on this problem is uh, called DBpedia. And also, I want to clarify, DBpedia is a huge project. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about the DBpedia info box extractor here. So we actually use it and try to see if it works for our purposes. Uh, what we notice are uh, you know, two, mainly two problems. One is uh, the implementation of the extractor uses a determinist mapping from the weak media templates, the code I showed from the previous slide, onto the target pred the predicates. Um, the, the, main uh, the main concern here is if there is a new template, then we need to actually uh, manually create a new mapping. And also if the template, existing template changes, then we actually need to kind of modify our mappings 
which is really not scalable because uh, we're running this uh, on a daily basis and try to kind of uh, capture the updates uh, continuously. The second main problem of this is the extractor actually relies very heavily on the anchor links presented in Wikipedia. And sometimes those anchor links can be wrong. So in this particular case, um, the uh, Wikipedia extractor actually extracts a triple that says Barack Obama has a child called the family of Barack Obama rather than Malia because the anchor link is wrong. In addition, us uh, the DPPD extractor just doesn't um, handle the unlinked names very well. In this case, Larry King has been married for multiple times. It only extracts one single name from this list. And from the question and answering perspective, if we don't have the full information of um, his marriage uh, history, then we potentially can uh, provide a wrong answer when user asks, uh, when user asks about uh, Larry King. So uh, to be able to kind of uh, uh, overcome these uh, challenges, uh, we actually build a new system called RIPE. Um, we, instead of using the weak media uh, code as input, we actually use HTML. Because HTML is more robust, um, the changes to HTML in the past decade matter very little in our context. And uh, additionally, we, we made a decision to actually use a machine learning model to extract such things. So distance sufficient, as Chris uh, uh, mentioned earlier, is one of the key enablers to our um, model training. And empirically, we show that we can, uh, when compared to the DBPDA extractor baseline, we actually substantially outperform the baseline uh, using the new system. Here's how, how it works. Um, the RIPE system basically consists of two major uh, components. The first one is called relation extraction. The output of this is basically a triple where uh, the subject and predicate are canonicalized, uh, but the object remains just literal. So uh, we, what we do is we start from the subject. Subject in this problem is kind of trivial, right? Because uh, it's basically the subject of the Wikipedia article. And because we made a decision to actually train a separate classifier for different uh, predicates, um, all those, you know, the predicate is also given uh, when you decide, uh, when, when you um, have the classifier ready. Then what it boils down is to find what are the possible values for the right, uh, for, for the right um, you know, extraction uh, for this particular predicate. All those values uh, in the orange box can be potentially candidates. Then we, base, uh, then we enumerate all of them and we just pair them up with the subject. For each such pair, uh, we, uh, we actually build a rich a library of features and uh, we represent them in those uh, lexicalized features. Um, as you all know, um, one of the key pieces to uh, a capable machine learning model is the supervision. Um, and, uh, you know, Chris also mentioned that earlier, it's just not feasible uh, financially or from a, a time perspective to label all those examples um, for dozens of predicates, if not hundreds. Um, so we made a decision, we made a design decision to use distance supervision to uh, create, automatically create supervision. And um, Chris actually talked about a, kind of a generalization of uh, this technique, but uh, one of the key heuristics uh, we have used is to match our unlabeled examples with uh, existing triples in the knowledge base. So in this particular case, we, we, we look at the Beatles, the pair of the Beatles and John Lennon, and we try to search for any triple that match the subject and the object. And it turned out uh, there is a relationship between them, which is uh, membership. And uh, whenever we find a match like that, we just label that particular uh, you know, a pair using the uh, relation. We use that uh, distance of vision and features uh, to train a bunch of classifiers for every single target uh, predicate and indicated by the PID sphere. Once we have the classifier, we apply those classifiers to uh, each individual unlabeled example. And in this case, uh, when we have the pair of the Beatles and Paul McCartney, um, the models would tell us, hey, uh, this PID, which represents the membership, uh, membership relationship, is the most likely one. 
All right, so the second component of uh, write is called entry linking. So now that we have the triple with only the object being literal value, uh, we need to link it to uh, the entity ID. We need to disambiguate it. I won't go into too much detail here uh, because it follows pretty much the same process as, we, uh, as I described uh, in the relation extraction. We basically go to the uh, notch base and we try to identify what are the potential entities that can be candidates to be linked to this phrase livable. It can be the city, it can be the football club, it can also be the university. Um, we, uh, similarly, we, uh, we kind of generate a bunch of features to represent them and uh, we rely on anchor links uh, to generate distance revisions to train a classifier. Now we, we apply the classifier over all those um, unlinked examples so that we can actually make a prediction and link the, um, uh, the object to the entity ID. To this far, then we actually have a triple with um, subject, predicate, and object, all canonicalized, represented by IDs. All right, so we built this system. We want to know how, how good it is. So what we did is we actually prepared a evaluation set. Um, what we sample a bunch of documents. We run both write and our baseline DBP data extractor over the same set of documents. And we pull those extractions and hand it over to human annotators. They don't know which extraction comes from which system. They just know, if, they just need to label if an extraction is correct. This is how we collect run truth sets. And then we just use a very standard uh, precision recall F1 scores to measure how the system is doing uh, with respect to ground truth sets. In addition to the precision recall in F1, we actually <clears throat> introduce a new uh, metric called list value completeness. Um, this, is actually a, this is actually a, a you know, question answering. This is a critical metric to question answering because um, for a list valued uh, relation type like children, if we extracted an incomplete set, let's say we didn't extract Sasha, then whenever um, you know, a, a user asks about Barack Obama, then we will be actually uh, returning an incomplete answer. If we extract something that is purely wrong, like Mary, um, then Siri will actually answer incorrectly. So that's a uh, quite bad for our uh, kind of uh, serial capability. So um, here are the results. Uh, we look at DBpedia. Um, they actually did quite well as expected on the precision. But when we compare it to our uh, bribe system, uh, we just simply outperformed them uh, substantially on recall, mainly because of two reasons. Uh, we, one, we use the machine learning model to do the interlinking. So we, we're, we don't blindly trust the anchor links. So sometimes they make mistakes, but our machine learning models will be able to pick up the right features to correct them. In addition, um, the, the DBPD extractor doesn't do super well on unlinked uh, entities. That's where uh, ripe system shine. And as you can tell, uh, we did much better uh, at the list completeness, which allows us to uh, answer accurately those uh, list value questions. Um, if you want to uh, read more about this uh, in detail, feel free to check out our paper uh, uh, at NACO 2019. All right, so I wanted the second concrete problem that I want to talk about, uh, this is kind of um, still ongoing uh, project. So some of the results might still be early. But um, I'm super excited about this um, problem and I wanted to tell you about it. So um, anti-resolution. So it is uh, kind of the key problem that we want to tackle um, to, in to kind of integrate the structure feeds. And we began to look at this problem uh, when we were developing a feature for the HomePod. So basically HomePod is kind of the smart the speaker uh, by Apple to uh, allow users to have a comprehensive music experience. However, most of the functionality, music-related functionality, is supported by iTunes. The, I, the iTunes data, uh, the backend data, does not know about the members of the Magic Dragons in this particular case. But we do. Siri does. And the, the key problem here is Siri does not understand the iTunes identifiers for, um, for the Magic Dragons. So how do we make the connection? 
uh, I want to, before I, I tell you how, how we did it, I want to take a step back and introduce you what the problem is in abstract. It's in the literature, it's usually called anti-resolution, uh, anti-matching, or record linkage, or deduplication. They're all, uh, you know, maybe there are some minor differences, but they're mostly about the same problem. You have multiple notch bases. Um, I'm using two here for simplicity. And uh, what you want to do is you want to automatically identify the equivalence uh, between those uh, notch bases. For example, uh, in our particular uh, you know, application, we want to understand the uh, Imagine Dragon nodes uh, in the center of the iTunes catalog is equivalent to the uh, Wikidata ID uh, in the green uh, notch graph. Once we have this equivalence relation detected, then we will be actually uh, make the connection and use the Siri um, question answering service to actually uh, answer the, the question a uh, user may have. Now, how we, how we solve this problem, we, we look at the data. iTunes is a very comprehensive catalog of all those music information, including albums, songs, uh, and artists. Wikidata is a general uh, purpose, uh, you know, notch base with a lot of like biographic information about artists, but not so much on uh, music information. So the only thing that we can reliably um, match them by the attributes are actually the names. The names are ambiguous. They're not super reliable. So how we solve this problem is actually making the problem more complicated by introducing a third knowledge base called uh, Music Brains. Music Brains is an open source uh, vertical uh, knowledge base. It doesn't have, uh, it's not as comprehensive um, as Wikidata in terms of uh, biographic information or uh, missing information uh, with respect to iTunes, but it has decent amount of information for us to uh, make the match. So how we, uh, so we started by matching music brains with Wikidata and we merged the entities that, that actually match uh, between the two. Then the merge entities start to have the music information that allows us to actually match with the iTunes entities. Uh, we build a, a simple kind of uh, deterministic system to do the anti-revolution for this particular problem, uh, particular problem. and we uh, evaluate it and see how, how we are doing here. We look at the most popular um, artists um, in the American iTunes store, and also we, we kind of sample just uniformly, randomly. We have two data sets, and we basically use this uh, standard precision recall to measure how well um, our system is doing. As you can tell from the table, our system is actually doing uh, fairly well in terms of precision. On the popular sets, um, it can actually achieve a, you know, a recall close to 90%. This is great. Once we build this, we realize there is a lot of value in such uh, structured feeds. But the problem is we have dozens, if not hundreds of uh, data sets, even internally lying around across Apple and each data set, the, the, each data set, the um, iTunes um, project takes an experienced uh, engineer three to six months to take to the production. And it's just simply too long for all those data sets if we want to build them individually uh, for every data set. So um, the, this is still a work in progress, but what we want to do is we want to build a general purpose machine learning model that will eventually allow any engineer to easily integrate a new data source Without knowing too much uh, detail about how the model works, all, all we need to care about is how we actually provide, uh, just to echo uh, what Chris was talking about, just to provide the labels that are useful to train the model and uh, being able to do e error analysis easily so that we can achieve the, uh, we can meet the production bar. And how we build this model, the, the, two, uh, the couple of uh, key ideas here is we want to leverage advances of uh, deep learning in the past few years by embedding those um, entities into real value vectors so that we can actually match the entities in vector space. This way, we don't need to write uh, you know, any function to compare those dates, to compare those um, uh, strings. And the intuition behind this, um, similar to the software 2.0 uh, philosophy, is to have the neural nets to learn how to approximate through function approximation how to approximate uh, the hand-coded heuristics that we usually hard-code by engineers from the labels that we feed to the, uh, feed to the model training. Um, here's, uh, I, I wanna briefly tell you how, how it works um, uh, at a high level. 
we start, you know, we start by a, a step called candidate generation. So for each, um, uh, this is uh, an example of kind of doing anti revolution for albums. And um, we start by looking at every single iTunes album. And instead of comparing that to every single entity in Wikidata, which is competitionally infeasible, we, we use the relaxed stream match to generate a, high, a short list of highly likely um, candidates from Wikidata. And we, we, uh, the model basically tried to um, embed each entity represented by a list of relations and their object values. So we embed the relation into the orange um, vector and we embed the, um, uh, the object value into the blue one. And once we have those list of um, uh, embedding vectors, we apply an encoder. Because we have uh, potentially a different number of relations, we need to fix them in, uh, we need to encode them into a fixed size uh, matrix so that we can do comparison with another entity. We, the encoder can be, um, you know, the, the choice of encoder can, can vary. It can be an LSTM, it can be a multi-headed um, self-attention mechanism. But the key, key, uh, the key thing here is once we have, we apply the same process to the entity from Wikidata and the, uh, to the entity in iTunes, then we can actually do a dot product between the two entity embeddings to form a similarity matrix. And, it, and we apply, you know, because it's a similar metric and uh, we want to identify if there is the pattern indicates a match, then we apply a convolutional neural net to make a prediction. Is this pair a match or not? So this is how the model works. And uh, just a quick recap, this is, um, this, is, um, this is the same data set we used to evaluate the, our production uh, system over artists. Um, the previous one is production and now is the new model. And uh, as we can see here, the, um, over the popular artists, we actually have slightly higher precision and recall, non-uniform random sample um, without any sacrificing precision, we were able to achieve over 20% absolute improvement uh, in recall. And um, our, uh, if you remember our main kind of goal there is to have this kind of common framework that we can apply to other data sets. And we actually did this experiment by, uh, you know, um, getting other data sets we have at Apple and just apply that uh, same network. Um, the labels, you, you need to generate different labels, but the uh, underlying framework stays the same. And as, as you can tell here, we were able to achieve production quality um, precision with a, a, you know, decent recall. And this is kind of a, you know, um, late breaking result. We actually have someone who, um, who is a fresh graduate, started um, three months ago, working on, new, she had li very little uh, exposure to uh, machine learning before. And she was actually able to onboard a new data set within three months um, at precision uh, of uh, 80%. So this was hardly uh, possible in the past. And we're, we're optimistic um, about the direction we're going here. All right, the key takeaways I want you to remember uh, from this talk uh, will be, uh, I'm from the team called Siri Knowledge. Our main two goals are, one, we want to provide um, kind of know-it-all um, question answering capabilities to all those user queries. And we want to be able to um, build the knowledge graph that can eventually represent all human knowledge. I presented two concrete problems we tackled um, uh, at Apple. One is uh, through, you know, careful design choices, we can actually uh, improve our uh, infobox extraction system by a large amount over the strong baseline. And also I describe how we, um, how we tackle the entity resolution problem here and uh, presented um, kind of a late uh, breaking results on how we actually make a general generalization of the model architecture and focus on label, label generation and error analysis. With all that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my talk. Um, happy to take questions here or uh, later. Yeah, thank you, Xiao. Thank you for that uh, very interesting process of creating the knowledge base for Siri, which is a favorite program for many of us.
we have um, 15 minutes or so where we can uh, take questions. Um, many of the questions have already been answered in the QA chat. Uh, but Narain, do we have a question for the panelists? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, the panelists did a very good job on answering the questions right there. Uh, so a couple of questions. Um, so this one is for Chris Ray. So Chris, uh, that's a very important topic that you touched on how to sort of uh, collect training data. Nothing disappoints a fresh grad data scientist more than asking them to help prep for training data. Have you done any research on making it more fun, gamification, good, those kinds of things? Looks like Chris is no longer in the meeting. Oh, okay. But uh, this question is equally valid for the other two panelists. Is there any way to make uh, the process of gathering the training data more fun and interesting for people? Juan, Chao, do you have any take on this? Uh, Juan, you might be muted. Yeah, you know, it's, it's very, very funny. I, I'm actually looking at my, my, my personal notes and I actually wrote a note on gamification incentives for data integration. So um, I, all I can say is uh, I think that would be a great idea and I've been, I just wrote it down in my personal notebook a couple of weeks ago. So yes, yeah, somebody work on it, please. <laughs> Cool, thanks. So here's another question for Shao. How do you decide which pages of Wikipedia to parse in which languages? Uh, do you basically get started with some specific things? How do you, how often do you update this knowledge base? Right, excellent question. Um, so uh, let me maybe start from the last question. So uh, at, as Siri Knowledge, we actually uh, continuously update our knowledge base on a daily basis. So any um, inputs to Wikipedia, um, we try to run them on a daily basis so that you know, new information can be updated in Siri Knowledge Graph. Um, how, how, did, how did I decide which pages uh, to parse? Oh, great. So um, some of the aspects are very entity type related. So uh, we started by looking at all person pages because they share a similar um, kind of a common set of attributes because that's uh, the classifier we're build, uh, building on top of. Uh, and then we gradually expand to other types, important types. Um, we have been mainly focusing on uh, languages. Uh, sorry, we have been uh, mainly focusing on English, um, but we have uh, some existing work on uh, tackling, you know, Similar, the same problem in other languages such as Spanish, uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese, Korean, etc. However, uh, the main benefit of tackling other languages are uh, not because of the, you know, common facts. Because when you look at those facts, they're canonical. A fact is a fact. It doesn't matter which language they're expressed. Uh, what matters is um, some entities might be might be existence uh, in the Spanish Wikipedia rather than in the English Wikipedia. If we don't build the uh, extractor for the Spanish one, then uh, we, we basically just miss the, uh, miss the extraction. However, that also in, in, incurs uh, potential problems because uh, what if the, you know, Spanish, the extraction, the, the data from the Spanish, like the birthday for the same person in the Spanish and the English Wikipedia articles what if they disagree? Then you basically uh, need to kind of find how do you, you know, build a fusion model to uh, resolve the conflicts. Um, I hope that answers the question. Cool, thank you. So another question for Juan. Um, so I think a lot of the audience is from the industry. Uh, so this question has resonated with a lot of them on your um, slide about the knowledge scientist. Can you talk more about that? How do you suggest people, how do you kind of hire people for this role? Also, is it like a horizontal role? Is it like a vertical role? So there are a couple of yeah. questions that map to this. So let me, I'll talk, I'm, I'm glad this came up. So I think the knowledge scientist is something, first of all, it's kind of it's the knowledge engineer 2.0. So if we go back into history, I'm a big proponent of understanding history because otherwise we're reinventing the wheel. Um, 
we had the knowledge engineers in the late 80s and the early 90s, right? They were the ones building expert systems, getting the rules out of that, and creating the rules, talking to the experts, uh, be able to devise that. Um, so within an organization, the common characteristics that we've seen of people who are great candidates for knowledge scientists are people who, uh, who again, remember they work on the, with both sides of their brains, right? They're people persons, right? But they also understand to work with tech people and they're great at uh, uh, doing data modeling. So they know how to use your, your traditional data modeling tools. They can go up into a whiteboard and they can go under, have the conversations and draw things on the whiteboard. That's one very important aspect. They also like to do documentation, believe it or not. A lot of people who've been in organizations, they, they're very diligent. I want to have all my documentation out there. And, and then on the more on kind of the, on, on the other side of the brain, there are people who actually know very well uh, SQL, they, they, but they know SQL, they know how to write scripts and stuff. So they have that balance between those two things. Um, and I think we're starting to see a lot of these, the, the, these two, these um, companies looking for them. They may be, they may still be called ontologists, but they're not just about kind of creating your schemas. I think it's really other people who are very clear, who are great. Uh, um, you know, they, they, they can, they, they, here's an example, real world example we had is they're musicians. Uh, they actually have dual degrees in computer science and in English and literature and philosophy. So that's an example of people working with kind of both sides of the brain. So those are the candidates that we found people within organizations and also hiring. So I think, I know there's more people coming in, but more questions. Yeah, I have a question for Kshal. Uh, I mean, you are addressing the core problems in building a knowledge graph, uh, entity resolution and entity linking. And in addressing these problems through machine learning, the biggest bottleneck is the training data. And if you have the training data, uh, human validation, right? And because you're doing the validation on web scale, the question arises, how much minimal human validation you need to do to be confident that your solution will scale for the whole web. And how, how, so can you quantify that? How much human effort are you willing to invest in the validation and how much is it, is it actually required? Right, um, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't have a great answer for your question. Um, currently from a knowledge uh, kind of information extraction perspective, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Wikipedia and uh, other reliable sources are still kind of uh, the main sources we extract from. And also the structure feeds, uh, we rely on kind of, we have internal data sets and also purchase fee, which are in good high, kind of good quality. Um, for every single data set, we kind of build models to resolve for a distant good because all those problems are essentially the integration problems. Um, we have a kind of a protocol. I, I don't know if I can disclose numbers, but we have the protocol how, you know, what is the evaluation methodology we, we use uh, in common? How do we, like I mentioned earlier, we usually say, you know, if uh, we meet the precision bar, which is usually 95% um, percent on a, you know, significant sample, then we, we kind of deploy the model. Uh, and have their run uh, on a regular basis. Um, I, I will, you know, just to be honest, I will, I will admit that um, there's still a lot of things we can do uh, to improve the quality, to kind of uh, uh, monitor the quality change over time because, you know, th there can be dis distribution shifts um, over time. Um, I believe there is still a lot to do, yeah. All right, Naren, next question. Ooh, so this is again for Shao. Do you use representational learning methods in Siri knowledge graph to find relationships between entities? Right, um, uh, yeah, great questions here <laughs> overall. Um, uh, representation learning is kind of a very broad concept. Uh, I want to maybe uh, narrow my answer a little bit to specific situations. So if you, if you, um, so for example, the uh, last bit of my you know, talk was about how you actually learn the embeddings for entities. That is one uh, instance of the representation learning. We use that for entity resolution. So 
um, if you think of equivalence as a special relationship between that, we do use that to predict a uh, relationship between entities. Um, if you're referring to, for example, maybe knowledge-based completion where uh, things like trans E um, is maybe the typical example of that, uh, we currently don't, uh, mainly because of the quality uh, concerns. Uh, they usually are good uh, at things where they're good at, but they, uh, when they make mistakes, they make uh, make mistakes uh, horribly. So from the product perspective, um, it's it's hard to kind of um, you know reliably use that um, uh, to answer questions. Okay. Uh, I have a question for um, Juan. Uh, you mentioned that you had some data sets regarding COVID-19. Are you doing any serious work to help with the COVID-19 problem? Oh, um, so at, at data.world, we are, we, we have the largest open data catalog and we're very happy to see how people are just pushing their data onto it. So ourselves internally, there are probably some internal products going on, but we believe that we can provide the most value as being a platform, an open platform where we can post a lot of data. I think it was announced today, the AP, the Associated Press, uh, they do all their data journalism on data.world and they have a lot of data sets about this. And I think they're about to release it, if not tomorrow, they already did it today. So please, we people are doing research, please look at data.world for those open data sets. I think it'll be valuable for, for the entire world. Uh, so another question for Kshaw, um, and this is coming from the QA stream. What do you think uh, you need in your knowledge graph for Siri to become a better personal assistant? Right. I was I was just trying to type the answer, but uh, I will probably answer uh, answer it live. So um, I I think that's a fair question. Um, I will probably not answer it directly. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to, um, but I will uh, probably say this, um, that, you know, a, a kind of the intelligence system requires a lot of aspects. Uh, it requires how do you track the conversation? How do you kind of, um, you know, solve maybe a potential co-reference resolution problem? Um, the work that, you know, the, um, my team has been working on, uh, the team I'm at, um, we have been focusing more uh, kind of try to understand those questions because it's understanding single questions is already a very challenging problem. Um, and we are trying to answer that precisely. So rather than just kind of chit chat like um, conversations to make the conversation go in. Um, kind of the whole Siri organization is working very hard to kind of put all the pieces together. Why uh, we are lacking behind? Um, uh, I, I don't think uh, I'm the right person to answer that, just to be honest. Cool. So uh, yeah, I think most of the questions have been answered. There's some very specific questions. Um, what tool is a good tool, generic good tool for inference in KG? Do you have some suggestions for the audience? Um, so I think there's several different kind of open source uh, inference engines. Uh, I know, for example, like out of academia, I went into industry well, there's a system called Pellet and that's part of Stardog. Stardog is a, a, a graph database, uh, that's one. Um, off the top of my head, I mean, a lot of these databases already have them incorporated. I think there's going to be a session here about uh, inferencing and stuff. So um, I think that's, I'm looking forward to that one too. Cool. Uh, thank you. So I think we just have five more minutes. So maybe we can end, end in this sort of an open question. On your mind, what are some open research questions that you would like to solve next, both of you? Jai, you can go first, and I'll, I'll go. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of uh, open open questions. So, um, so we we built this kind of general purpose um, entry resolution problem. Uh, it works well for uh, kind of purchase feeds because their ontologies are uh, kind of well defined. Um, very different from the situation that Juan was talking about, uh, which is completely you know very messy. Um, it will be interesting how, how you would do inter-resolution and the ontology alignment uh, together. 
uh, currently plantage alignment uh, for us um, because the data sets are so well uh, defined and the, the kind of the attributes we need to use for matching are kind of usually in dozens. It's, um, you know, it's easy for a human to actually sort it out within a day. Uh, and we have an ontologist uh, working on that. But it will be interesting if we can find an autom uh, automatic way to do that. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, the work that Chris has been talking about, uh, data augmentation, how do you actually, because it's kind of fascinating that when you learned uh, the model actually matters less, the SBM, which was super popular 20 years ago, still kind of work within uh, maybe 2% of margin from the latest deep learning model. Then you may wonder what what actually you know what makes um, data augmentation. I do believe on how do we kind of uh, understand it will be open um, open research directions. Yeah, well, I, I we actually have several research projects going on, and um, so I, we can talk about several of them. One is so we presented this methodology, uh, and this methodology um, is completely manual. I will acknowledge that from the beginning. And it was manual on purpose because the way we kind of thought about it was like, well, we needed to actually get a job done and make sure that we can, that we can make sure and, and tell the customer this is right. And that actually serves as our baseline. And we've actually been able to determine all these very specific steps and understand clearly how this should get done by a human. Now, the question is, now that I have that really well specified, what can I start automating? What parts, what different steps of that can I automate and how much can I automate that? And I think that's one of the particular, so that's one of the research topics that we have. And I think it's open is understanding this relationship between the people and the methodology. And from there, what can we automate? So that's one question. And from there, an example that we have is uh, in my presentation, I showed this example, this really complicated SQL query. Uh, one of the things I would like to do is to basically almost reverse engineer what that SQL query is and be able to determine, hey, maybe there's important concepts in here. Maybe there's mappings that we can learn from this existing very complicated SQL query out of that. And this query can be able to explain this information that we have. So being able to kind of reverse engineer a query, that's a product that we have. Um, another aspect that we've seen a lot is a kind of understanding the relationship between humans and, and how they interpret data. So for example, uh, there's a lot of nulls in a database. And you, you, I can automatically figure out how many nulls are in the database. So what? Should I care? Should I not care? When should I care? Do they make an implication about depending on the query workload that I have? You can see from the theoretical side for the last 40 years, or if not more, people have been, been studying different semantics of nulls, but we really do not know how those different semantics of nulls are interpreted by people and even how they're implemented in different systems. So I think understanding those types of different models. Uh, and then finally, I think another interesting aspect is to say, we argue that maybe graphs is the best way to uh, model information for integration, but there's other different ways to go. You, you, want, you may wanna use a tabular format to do this. Uh, we really need to understand more the relationship between how people, human are consuming the data and the types of data models that we have. Uh, we've invented so many data models over the last 50 years and we'll continue to invent them going forward. How do we know that this is the best data model for an X, part, X or Y particular use case? I think these are very open, open questions and, and there's an interesting theory, there's interesting systems to be built and there's interesting kind of overlap between kind of the social sciences and also the computer sciences. I think that's an excellent point to conclude today's conversation. I really thank both of uh, the speakers as well as Chris Ray for illuminating us from very different perspectives, very manual way of doing data integration, automation, weak supervision, and some mixture of the two. So thank you all very much. And we look forward to being here next Tuesday, same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much thank for you. everything. Thanks.